six to ten percent not a big percentage but for the children for children yes it is a major form second most common group of tumors in children so what is the first common uh, osteosarcoma the second uh, osteosarcoma are the second most common group of sarcomas in children of all bone sarcomas ewing sarcoma family tumors have the youngest average age at presentation right so these tumors are the tumors that will present at the youngest age uh, in the children peak age less than 20 80% of the people are less than 20 so which means we are still left with 20% of people who have got almost all ages involved incidents boys are unlucky ones more frequently affected why they frequently affected as blacks and nations are rarely inflicted which means we do have some black pigment uh, defense white people do not have that defense possibly i just uh, i just think that that could be the reason because blacks and nations both of us have got black pigment Ewing sarcoma family tumors arise in the diaphyses of long bones. What did I just say? Diaphyses. Until now, we have been studying all pathologies in the metaphyses. 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 This comes to be in the diaphyses. Well, then this is the tumor of diaphyses, and you must remember that if a diaphyseal tumor, small child, high fever, and inflammation at the site. is there and you are suspecting a malignancy then it is nothing else but ewing sarcoma flat bones of the pelvis and femur the two sites that the tumor loves are flat bones of the tumor and the femur look at the pelvis 24.7% of the times it is involved and femur 16.4% of the times it is involved and rest of them are much lesser Ewing sarcoma family tumors presents as a painful enlarging mass societis tender warm and swollen which means all the inflammatory signs are there painful tender warm swollen right just look at this it is really tender big warm and angry looking very angry tumor and if you touch it it only hurt Uh, affected individuals have systemic findings that may make infection of course infection does the same it could cause as fever in little children and elevated sedimentation rate and leukocytosis and anemia it does cause all the same in the little children and even sarcoma family but we will have to do a radiograph don't you think this child needs a radiograph at least an x ray of the leg yes so that x ray shows destructive lytic tumor with permeative margins that extend into the surrounding soft tissues now it has gone out of its boundaries it has gone into the soft tissues so you think of ewing sarcoma in a child plain radiograph destructive just look at the destructive lytic tumors that has gone out of its margin permeative margins that extend into the surroundings of tissues just look at this frontal and lateral x ray of femur demonstrate mottled osteolytic lesion blue circles with poorly marginated edges in diaphyses of the bone in diaphyses in diaphyses ewing sarcoma of tumor family of tumor is in diaphyses so you will remember that a diaphyseal tumor in a child is ewing sarcoma so i told you there is something called sunburst periosteal reaction in osteosarcoma it comes here again in the sunburst periosteal reaction in ewing sarcoma why is that so it is a rapidly growing tumor it is a rapidly growing tumor right a rapidly growing tumor shows sunburst periosteal reaction so this tumor will show sunburst periosteal reaction as well laminated periosteal reaction ah well this is very much specific for the ewing sarcoma laminated 
means several lamella periosteal reaction uh, we will call that onion skinning and that is pathognomonic of this tumor alone even sarcoma family of tumors have onion skinning the characteristic periosteal reaction produces layers of reactive bone in an onion skin fashion layer after layer look at this onion look at this onion and look at the periosteal reaction S layer after layer and that is what that tumor is doing layer after layer most even sarcoma family tumors contain 11 22 translocation q44 and q12 that is easy to remember 1122 call 1122 for emergency most even sarcoma family tumors contain 1122 classification q24 q12 translocation right so that was good and look at what uh, the mutation it has ca caused generation in frame fusion of even even ews gene on chromosome 22 to the fli1 gene that is friend interaction one gene friend leukemia integration one transcription factor friend leukemia integration fusion of uh, even sarcoma to the members of e26 transformation specific transcription factor family the exact fusion sites vary between the tumors but leading that leads to a down to a different downstream effect how does the even sarcoma fusion proteins uh, contribute to transformation this remains unsettled unfortunately we don't know how even sarcoma fusion proteins contribute to the transformation however we think that it affects on transcription we think it has a rna splicing effect or a cell cycle machinery effect some defect is there because this involves a wide array of uh, uh, things to discover effects of transcription either it is splicing or the cell machinery problem similar to cells of origin remains to be uh, similarity uh, similarly cells of origin remain to be identified whether it is mesenchymal or primitive neuroectodermal however we consider more of uh, primitive neuroectodermal because they look like that because morphology says it is primitive neuroectodermal however it can be mesenchymal we can be mistaken unless proven otherwise we have to prove it morphology what it looks like the gross morphology it arises into the medullary cavity in the hollow space oh well then it invades the cortex periosteum and the soft tissues it is coming from inside to outside tumor is soft tan areas of hemorrhage and necrosis are frequent well you can see and appreciate areas of hemorrhage and necrosis it is composed of sheets of uniform small round cells small round cells that have scant cytoplasm cytoplasm may appear clear because it is rich in glycogen therefore all what you can see is the nucleus that forms sheets of cells they are slightly larger and more cohesive they are slightly larger and more cohesive than lymphocytes right is slightly larger <clears throat> these are the sheets of cells clear cytoplasm and a small rim of cytoplasm that that just covers the uh, that surrounds the nucleus presence of former right rosettes remember that this is also pathognomonic for this tumor a bone tumor that on histology presents homer right rosettes homer right rosettes are true rosettes rosettes is a flower right it's a rose it's a flower so these flowers are true flowers because rounded uh, rounded group of cells with a central fibrillary core a false rosette has a blood vessel inside 
right but the central core is fibrillary if it has got a central fibrillary core then it is a true rosette and we have got two kinds of true rosettes and one of them is homer right rosettes the second we will study in the cns now indicates greater degree of neuroectodermal differentiation and this actually has often evidence that it belongs to the neuroectodermal origin uh tumor contains fibrous septa you can see so much of fibrous tissue that is dividing the tumor there is generally little stroma uh well yes there is little stroma they are all see of they are all sheets of cells there is hardly any stroma geographic necrosis may be prominent which means uh, like necrosis that doesn't follow any rules going everywhere putting its uh, feet <clears throat> into the cells here and there since we see such a large sheet of cells you just see sheets of cells everywhere surprisingly the mitotic figures are not as common as we thought so there are relatively few mitotic figures in relation to the dense cellularity of the tumor oh, well i just like this picture so much you can see a uh, round blue cell tumor running after little children that have friend number 1 family friend one transcription factor so that is the gene they carry and they affect the long bone or the flat bone and if they affect the long bone or the flat bone they produce a laminated tumor there that is ewing sarcoma family tumors tumor that has got uh, so many lamination uh, lamellated that is lamellated like an onion so that is an uh, what an onion shows ewing sarcoma family tumors are aggressive malignancies treated with new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgical excision or with or without radiation so let me explain a little new adjuvant chemotherapy means that the tumor is large and so aggressive that you have to reduce the size of the tumor first and then excise it so if you give chemotherapy just to reduce the size of the tumor and make it more uh, excisable then the chemotherapy is called as neoadjuvant chemotherapy given after the uh, chemotherapy uh, the after surgery and uh, radiation is called as adjuvant chemotherapy adjuvant chemotherapy is meant to deal with the micrometastasis right ewing sarcoma can occur any time during childhood and young adulthood but it usually develops during puberty when the bones are growing rapidly it is 10 times as common in caucasian children as african american and in asian children do you know what is caucasian it is a caucasian is a mountains name where specific skull type is there and mostly it is white people who get affected five year survival rate only 75% long term cure in 50% of the people 50% is not very good which means one will live and the other will die the amount of chemotherapy induced necrosis in an important prognostic factor so how will you see prognosis is the amount of necrosis that is present after chemotherapy chemotherapy induced necrosis giant cell tumor of the bone hmm another tumor of the bone but this is the last tumor that we are going to study and that is giant cell tumor of the bone osteoclastoma so as the name suggest osteoclastoma is a tumor of osteoclast right so it is the giant gct 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 it is so often spoken that people tend to forget the other name osteoclastoma and the examiners are love to tease the little poor students they call it the features of osteoclastoma and students just know gct giant cell tumor and they forget that it has another name as well and they answer that i don't know this tumor and you fail on the test and um 
I just don't understand how to <laughs> how to write stimulate your mind and tell you that it is one and the same tumor. So please try to uh, remember the second names of the tumor. Giant cell tumor is so named because histology is dominated by, by multinucleated osteoclast type giant cells giving rise to synonym osteoclastoma, right? Multi it's because it has got a lot of multinucleated cells and we think that it is the osteoclast underlying all these giant cell tumors. It is an uncommon, benign, locally aggressive tumor, right? Do you remember basal cell carcinoma? Yes, basal cell carcinoma is locally aggressive and giant cell tumor is a benign tumor that is locally aggressive. All what it does is it recurs if it is of stage four tumor. If it, has, if it has got a higher grade, then the grade, because of the higher grade, it will locally recur. And peak, in, peak age is 20 to 40 years, peak age 20 to 40 years, which means it begins after the Ewing sarcoma age has passed. Ewing sarcoma was less than 20. This one is 20 to 40 years. Pathogenesis, neoplastic cells of giant cell tumor are primitive osteoblast precursors. Primitive osteoblast, neoplastic cells of giant cell tumors are primitive osteoblast precursors. Neoplastic cells represent only a minority of tumor burden. The bulk of tumor consists of non-neoplastic osteoclast and their precursors. So uh, he thinks that it is the osteoblast that is to be uh, accused and not the osteoclast. The neoplastic cells of giant cell tumor are primitive osteoblast precursors. Not even osteoblast, osteoblast precursors. B9 giant cell tumor illustrating abundant multinucleated giant cells with a background of mononuclear stromal cells. You can see large cells with a single dark staining nuclei lining between the giant cells. Yes, these small cells are mononucle mononuclear stromal cells. Sometimes there are too many giant cells and it is easy to diagnose, diagnose JCT of the bone. Sometimes the JCT or the, or the giant cells in the, uh, in the giant cell tumor are not too many. And the mononuclear stromal cells are more. That gives it a, a higher grade. Higher grade is a poorer grade. That gives it a higher grade and the higher the grade more likely the recurrence of the tumor. The new plastic cells express, uh, express high level of rankle, which promotes proliferation of the osteoclast precursor. Rankle is meant for uh, meant for uh, the bone destruction, osteolytic effect. Rankle are osteolytic uh, receptors. So what they do is proliferation of osteoclast precursors and their differentiation into mature osteoclast. The feedback between osteoblast and the osteoclast is absent, which means if there is more osteoclast, the osteoblast would not proliferate. The feedback regulates, regulates the process during bone remodeling. Pathogenesis. So what will be the pathogenesis? What is the result is localized but highly destructive resorption of the bone matrix by reactive osteoclast. So if it is only osteoclast and they keep getting proliferated and there are no osteoblasts, so this is what is going to happen. Giant cell tumor arise in the epiphysis. What did I say? Epiphysis? But may extend into the metaphysis. Epiphysis. Now we have come to the pathology of bone that lies in the apophysis. Until now we have studied so many pathologies in the metaphysis and a single pathology in the diaphysis that was Ewing sarcoma family tumors, right? Now we are talking about apophysis. So this is the tumor that lives there. And it can go into the metaphysis because the metaphysis lies below it and then the diaphysis lies. No, 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 it doesn't go that far. It just goes to the metaphysis because it is, uh, we call it as a benign tumor. So it doesn't go 
very far. Majority rise around the knee. So it will be distal femur and proximal tibia again. But any bone can be involved. That, that means only the majority rise around the knee. However, the bones are not forgiven. The typical location of these tumors near the joint frequently causes arthritis-like symptoms. So the person will think joint pain, joint pain must be osteoarthritis because it arises after 20s and between 20s and 40s. So x-ray, oh, well, yes, x-ray. The x-ray of the knee of the leg anterior posterior view shows osteolytic lesion in the proximal tibia. Osteolytic lesion. Osteolytic lesion by the word osteolytic lesion, we are not very much sure if it could be osteosarcoma, a more aggressive and a very bad tumor we don't want there to be. But it is only an osteoclastoma or a giant cell tumor. So there's another way of knowing it. What is the other way? It is soap bubble appearance of the bone. Please write that in your book because the book has not written soap bubble appearance. But I have seen several MCQs that talk of soap bubble appearance in the bone. And that is an osteoclastoma because soap bubble is pathognomic for the soap bubble on radiograph is pathognomic for giant cell tumor and there's another tumor that is abc uh, that is aneurysm of bones uh, aneurysm bone cyst aneurysm bone cyst is not in your course so if we talk of uh, soap bubble then it is osteoclastoma mostly they are single right solitary However, multicenteric tumors can also be occur and they are also seen, especially in the distal extremities. Patients present with pathological fractures. Well, that is not nice. Pathologi uh, pathological fractures in giant cell tumor, anterior posterior view. You can see the femur getting fractured. Of pelvis and hip joints show osteolytic lesion with pathological fracture. There is an osteolytic lesion. So it is just a pathological fracture, nobody hit there. And the trochanteric region, a right proximal femur. Yes, we can see the proximal end of the femur getting fractured. Giant cell team of the proximal fabula is a predominantly lytic. Giant cell of the proximal fabula and that is lytic. You can see that lytic. And look at that soap bubble appearance, I love it. Expensile with destruction of the cortex, the pathological fracture is also prominent. Morphology, gross, what is the gross? Giant cell tumor destroys the overlying cortex. It produces a bulging soft tissue mass. The mass is demarcated by a thin shell of reactive bone. These are large red-brown masses that frequently undergo cystic degeneration. Giant cell tumors destroys the overlying cortex. Yes, I, I know you know it. It produces a bulge in the soft tissue mass. I know you could understand that. The mass is demarcated by a thin shell of reactive bone. Uh, well, uh, demarcated by a thin shell of reactive bone, that means it has not broken the bone. It means it has, it is confined by the thin reactive bone that is uh, around it. You can just see that thin reactive bone still stays there. These are frequently red brown masses that frequently undergo cystic degeneration. Uh, the radiologically, radiologically it is graded as well as an latent active and aggressive lesion. Right? So radiologically it has got grade one, grade two and histologically grading is given on histological grading is given by the number of the by the mononuclear cells, that is stromal cells, and the multinucleated giant cells. The multinucleated giant cells, the multinucleated giant cells, the more they are, the smaller the grade. That is, grade one will have a lot of multinucleated giant cells. Gross findings, you can see necrosis, you can see cavitation, you can see so many cavities there. Destructive red brown mass involving the entire distal femur. A few cystic lesions are there.
typical giant cell tumor involving distal radius and that and the uh, cortices have been destroyed and the lesion is expensile. Histology, the tumor consists of sheets of uniform oval mononuclear cells. Yes, you have seen that mononuclear cells, oval mononuclear cells, sheets of oval mononuclear cells. Uniform oval mononuclear cells, numerous osteoclast type giant cells with 100 or, uh, 100 or more nu nuclei are there. All right. Is there anything special, Mohammed Jima? All right. So, uh, so you can see the uniform mononuclear cells and you can see the giant cells. Too many nuclei. Like I feel like even they're flowing out, there's so many nuclei and they're 100 or more. Nuclei of the mononuclear cells and osteoclasts are similar. Are they? Yes, they are exactly similar. They are ovoid with prominent nucleoli. Look at the nucleoli. They are oval shaped and they have prominent nucleoli. So you can read the text and you can study the uh, micrograph together. Right? And please do that every time you read histology. So we've got lots of giant cells and mononuclear cells. The mononuclear cells are uh, of same shape and size and their nuclei are similar to the nuclei in the giant cells. Histology of GCT, giant cell tumor. They are composed of multinuclear giant cells, C of round to oval mononuclear cells. These tumors are benign, yes, biologically benign and treated by curatage and resection and when radiated, they undergo malignant transformation. The neoplastic population of osteoblast precursor is difficult to identify on routine histology. Necrosis and mitotic activity may be prominent. A reactive bone may, may be present at the periphery of the lesion, right? The tumor cells do not synthesize bone or cartilage, which means they are neither bone producing nor cartilage producing tumors. Histology infarct like necrosis is seen in the giant cell tumor. Some tumors may be completely necrotic. There is no inflammatory response. The ghost outlines of multinucleated giant cells will still be visible and helpful in the diagnosis. Do you see any ghost in there? No? And uh, he, we just studied that there are no inflammatory cells. Nothing. So they don't detect anything abnormal to come in between and produce inflammation. And there is a lot of necrosis. Yes, there is a lot of necrosis. You can see a lot of pink area. There is a lot of pink area in between and this lot of pink area that is a lace of pink in just in the center you can see that and you can see a lot of uh, nuclei getting necrosis and do you see any ghost cells yes i can you see on the corner where the blood vessel lies near that blood vessel there are several ghost cells I think this is a larger magnification of the same and you can just see ghost cells very clearly. What is this? 20 to 40. So the age of presentation is 20 to 40. And the shell of uh, the say so many um, squares and marks, these marks and shells of, uh, they represent the uh, uh, the soap bubble appearance. Just look at him making soap bubbles, right? The rabbit is making soap bubbles. So that is the soap bubble appearance. At, and it involves the epiphysis. And look at number two. It involves the epiphysis. What else is there? Yes, and the knee joint is involved. You can see uh, the rabbit is sitting on a giant cell tumor that sits on the knee. Right, knee joint. Clinical course, up to 4% of the tumors metastatize to the lungs, but they may regress spontaneously. They're seldom fatal, right? So they're seldom fatal. 
this is one of the benign tumors one of the benign tumors that metastasizes to the lungs giant cell tumor are treated with curettage about 40 to 60% may occur locally the rankle inhibitor denosumab yes so we have found a uh, therapy there is denosumab it is a rankle inhibitor this is a specific therapy specific therapy or receptor specific therapy has shown a promise as an adjuvant therapy in uh, giant cell team of the bone what is this this is just the end of the bone tumor and this is the next topic that is the gout what is gout look at that beast uh, that is beast is just on the big toe gout in the olden days it was called as podagra right and in the olden days it was called as disease of the rich and it had affected the big toe right disease of the rich that had affected the big toe uh, how we will go about this disease gout is first we will go to the definition and we will understand what we are reading, what we are studying, uh, what is all about the gout. Now we have come to the topics of joints. We have uh, almost finished the bones. There is almost nothing left about the bones but now we will begin with the joint. Joint diseases, uh, we have uh, gout, pseudo gout in the joints. We have got osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, right? So these are the pathologies in the joint that we are going to study. And then we can study the soft tissues. So what about the gout? We will go to the pathogenesis and then the stages of the disease and how it affects uh, the body. Gout is the monosodium urate crystals. In gout, there is something called crystals, crystallization, monosodium urate crystals. These crystals are found inside the joints and are marked by transient attacks of acute arthritis. So all what the story is about, if you find crystals in crystals of monosodium urate, crystals of monosodium urate in the joint, then it is gout. If you don't find these crystals in the joint, then it is not gout. And what these crystals do, they uh, cause repeated attacks of acute gout or uh, chronic gout may persist for a very long time. And it is divided into primary and secondary forms, both sharing common fe features of hyperuricemia. So the hyperuricemia of several decades is there before actually the gout is precipitated. Right Before the gout comes in, hyperuricemia of several uh, years is there, maybe 30 years. So before gout comes on. Primary gout, 90% of the cases, the cause is unknown. That I don't like. The cause is unknown, so it has been left to be discovered. For the 90% of the cases, the cause is yet to be discovered. For the secondary gout, only 10% is left for the secondary gout. Cause is uric acid, increase in uric acid because of unknown, because of a known underlying disease. Known underlying disease means, uh, but yes, known underlying disease means either there is a lot of uh, intake of uh, high protein rich diet protein rich diet produces increased uric acid and that causes hyperuricemia so all protein rich diets for very long time taking protein rich diets for very long time will produce this gout look at the burger this burger has got so much of meat and every time you eat meat and meat it produces hyperuricemia Elevated uric acid levels uh, also occur because of reduced excretion or maybe both the things together. Reduced excretion, why would there be anything called reduced excretion? Maybe, maybe 
the kid there is kidney damage maybe we're taking some drugs or the patient is taking some drugs that will competitively inhibit the excretion of uh, uric acid maybe they are taking alcohol alcohol likes to go out before the uric acid does so it competes with the uric acid for excretion and causes therefore hyperuricemia increased synthesis increase uric acid is the end product of purine metabolism increased urate synthesis reflects increased purine production the synthesis of purine nucleotides is a uh, nucleotide pre-nucleotide is two interlinked it has got two interlinked pathways de novo pathway and salvage pathway de novo pathway in the de novo pathway these purine nucleotides are synthesized from non purine purine precursors right from non purine precursors and in the salvage pathway purines are synthesized from free purines based from the dietary intake and catabolism of purine nucleotides so it, in salvage pathway it just involves the pre-existing nucleotides in pre-existing purines right so uric acid comes from purines and from where are purines derived either they are produced and new new purines are produced or they are taken from uh, the dietary sources if they're taken from the dietary sources that that is de novo pathway and if new uh, oh, sorry if the previous existing purines are uh, they're taken into account then it is salvage pathway so these are the two processes where purines are used or produced or they are either uh, produced or reutilized now we talk of foods that are very rich in purines or very rich in proteins and bacon pork they are one and the same thing lamb meat no matter whatever meat is there it is rich in uh, uric acid birds turkey and goose are specially marked seafood fish it is uh, salmon sardines trout cod fish eggs and all these oysters shrimp all these have got high quantity of proteins high quantity of purines and high quantity of uric acids and look at the number of alcohol bottles i don't know the names of all but i just know no matter whatever alcohol is there it means all alcohol all alcohols mean increase uric acid food with moderate amounts of purines poultry that is chicken and duck they have got lesser purines right chicken and duck have got lesser purines but the goose have got a lot of purines legumes beans chickpeas and uh, peas and lentils these are uh, cauliflower spinach these are the vegetables that have still got a little bit of uh, or you can say they are a little slightly higher in their purine content cauliflower spinach right so seafood lobster and crab meat beef veal rabbit foods with low or no level of purines rice lovely and look at the lemon and oranges and the eggs and the almonds and so many things are there milk tea coffee chocolate thin yellow cheese hard boiled eggs cereals such as bread pasta corn meal potatoes white rice and there are vegetables cauliflower rest is uh, we are not using all these cassava sago cauliflower lettuce spinach and water chestnuts sweets and fruits so age of the individual and duration of hyperuricemia matters i told you it takes decades which means 20 to 30 years of hyperuricemia before the crystals start forming and start depositing into the joints see he's rich for so many years and he is taking all those drugs and he is obese and he has got age more than 45 and he has got uh, lead poisoning as well he's got so many things he's got lead poisoning as well and that 
cause pudegra. Pudegra is pain in his stool. That is because of uh, increased uric acid deposition of crystals there, and so he's bandaged his foot, right? And he's shouting in pain. He's got a lot of pain. Uric acid is filtered by the glomerulus. It is completely resolved in the proximal tubules of the kidney. The small fraction of uric acid is secreted by a distal nephron and is excreted in the urine. Genetic predisposition. Uh, until now, all of the four T classes said they knew of this disease. Uh, that is uh, X-linked abnormality of hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, uh, transferase, right? A hypoxanthine, hypoxanthine uh, guanine phosphoribosyl transferase. Polymorphism in gene uh, involved in urate transport, uh, urate and transport, and home homeostasis are also associated with gout. URT1 and GLUT9. Do you know this GLUT? Urate, you see, uh, polymorphism in genes involving urate transport and homeostasis. Urate, URAT1. Urate, URAT1. Gene, URAT1 gene is easy to remember because it is urate as uh, only E is missing for urate. URAT is there. One. And glute, do you remember glute? There are five glutes for uh, glucose transportation. You have studied in biochemistry glutes. Co let the glucose molecule in and out, which one is actually uh, regulated and the other ones uh, allow free uh, intake of the glucose. I hope you remember all that. But GLUT9 is not involved in uh, the glucose transport. It is involved here in the uric acid transport. An abnormality in the GLUT will, of course, cause then your hyperuricemia. Primary gout, hyperuricemia. So mostly the primary gout is caused by increased uric acid biosynthesis of unknown cause. Minority of patients have identifiable enzymatic defects, and defects, for example, partial deficiency of hypoxanthine guanine pyrophosphate transferase, partial deficiency interrupts the salvage pathways, so purine metabolites do, cannot be salvaged and instead degraded into uric acid. So you have broken the salvage pathways. Bro broken salvage pathways mean uh, increased uric acid in the body. Complete absence of AG, AGPRT is also results in hyperuricemia partial or complete absence of mm, uh, HGPRT results in hyperuricemia. Leish-Nahan syndrome. Leish-Nahan syndrome is associated with complete absence of AGPRT. There are significant uh, there are significant neurological manifestation because of which it is classified as secondary gout. Lishnehan, a rare hereditary disease, affects young boys more than the girls, usually causes early death. It is marked by compulsive self-mutilation of head and hands together with learning difficulties. I don't they these people are really, really retarded so how will they learn so they've got uh, even small things they can't learn involuntary muscle movements in there so we said that there is marked compulsive self-mutilation of the head and hands so it is so bad it is so bad look at this fellow eating his hands uh, that they have to be tied to their bed and the head has to have a helmet. The hands have to be tied to the sides of the bed. Look at this so bad. Look at the teeth of this patient. Right. Secondary gout can also be caused by increased production. That is rapid cell lysis during chemotherapy for leukemia. Because some tumors like leukemia Leukemias and lymphomas, if their chemotherapies are effective, they will kill the uh, malignant cells quickly. And 
lysis of the malignant cells will release a huge amount of purines out of the nucleic acids and these purines will have such a large load that will that the salvage uh, mechanism will not be very effective for them the second salvage mechanism will be not very effective for them and that will result in increased uric acid dec decrease excretion that means chronic renal failure inflammation in gout is triggered by monosodium urate crystals into the joint the result is production of cytokines. What is that? Cytokines recruit leukocytes. Cytokines, they are start, they have started talking. Since monosodium urate crystals are released, these are needle-like crystals. Needles will, uh, will disturb the cells or will damage the cells and the cells will start talking and start shouting and will throw a lot of cytokines there and the cytokines will call on the leukocytes, their defense mechanism, the police of the body. They come in, there is some damage going on, very bad damage caused by the needles from where the, these needles come and these needles have to be dealt with. Inflammasome. Inflammasome is an intracellular sensor that recognizes the crystals. Now the inflammasome knows these crystals and macrophage phagocytose those MSU monosodium urate crystals. Inflammasome is a multi-protein intracellular complex that detects the pathogenic microorganism and sterile stressors and activate a highly pro-inflammatory cytokine interleukin. Right, interleukin 1b and interleukin 18. These two interleukins will further call other cells of inflammation. Inflammasome also induces a form of cell death term pyroptosis. Pyroptosis. Uh, we know about apoptosis. What is this pyroptosis? Pyroptosis is caused. It is the death of the macrophages that have got those needles, destroying the needles and destroying the cells. So the cells that have a pathogen will not exist and will not um, take this disease elsewhere. So it is another pathway of self-destruction that has been named to rhyme with apoptosis pyroptosis rhymes with ap apoptosis it is slightly different mechanism it is meant to kill only the inflammatory cells that have the pathogens see all this stuff the inflammasome activates caspases one which in which is involved in the production of, of sub, uh, sorry, which is pro, uh, involved in the production of some active cytokine. For example, interleukin one. Interleukin one causes or invites other pro-inflammatory agents. It promotes accumulation of neutrophils and macrophages in the joints. So neutrophils and macrophages will come in there. Inflammasome will call more uh, of the macrophages and it will cause uh, uh, the neutrophils as well. Too. Neutrophils, do you know they also phagocytose things? Both of them phagocytose things. They're both uh, phagocytosing cells. So inflammation in the gout, that is how the needles set, uh, settle in the joints and these joints start swelling and the sw swollen uh, synovium there it starts producing inter one, interleukin 1 beta or 1b, interleukin 1 beta or 1b will call in so many things, macrophages, neutrophils, other uh, will trigger a whole casket of uh, inflammatory cytokines. These cells in turn release are the cytokines, free radicals, proteases, arachidonic acid metabolites, all of which recruit more leukocytes and damage the cell. Urate crystals may activate complement system as well. So they lead to generation of chemotactic complement byproduct. These cascades trigger an acute arthritis. 
which typically remits spontaneously in days to weeks. Solubility in uh, of a monosodium urate crystalline joint is modulated by temperature, com chemical composition of the fluid. Solubile fluid is inherently a poor solvent for monosodium urate crystal, crystal than plasma. So do you understand that? They have not deposited anywhere else but in the in the joints because synovium could not dissolve them. The plasma was relatively better in dissolving these crystals, so they did not settle in other places like liver and kidney. In uh, they did not settle. They do damage kidney. Actually, they do damage kidney, but they are in higher concentration in the kidney. And um, what about this? There's some all other organs are spared, mostly spared except the kidney. Kidney and joints are mostly affected. So the temperature and chemical composition of the fluid matters for the solubility of these crystals. Lower the temperature of the joint favors more precipitation. Chemical composition of the fluid crystallization is dependent on the presence of nucleating agents such as insoluble collagen fibers, chondroitin sulfate, proteoglycans, and cartilage fragments. What factors convert asymptomatic hyperuricemia into primary gout? Hyperuricemia does not necessarily lead to gouty arthritis. Yes, there is hyperuricemia, but it doesn't mean there is gout unless monosodium urate crystals are formed. Many factors convert asymptomatic hyperuricemia into gout. Age of the individual, genetic predisposition, heavy alcohol consumption, obesity, drugs like thiazides and lead toxicity, they all cause repeated attacks of acute gout. Right, you can see this person sitting there drinking alcohol, he's obese, he has drugs and lead toxicity. So eventually leads to chronic tophaceous arthritis and formation of tophoi in the inflamed cap, in the inflamed synovial membrane and periarticular cartilage. Severe damage to the cartilage develops and function of the joint is compromised. Morphology. District, the distinctive morphological changes are acute arthritis, chronic tophaceous arthritis, to find various sites and gouty nephropathy. So acute arthritis, you can very easily understand so many crystals are there. It will cause some acute damage and acute inflammatory reactions causing acute arthritis. So... Yes, chronic tophaceous arthritis. If acute attacks reoccur, they will cause chronic tophaceous arthritis. Tophi, what is tophia? It is a stone. Actually, stones are formed in various sites. Gouty nephropathy, and it will kill the kidney, right? So, kidney failure. Acute arthritis. Uh, acute arthritis is characterized by dense neutrophilic infiltrate and that permeates the synovium and synovial fluid, monosodium urate crystals. Crystals are found in the cytoplasm of neutrophils. These are uh, arranged in small clusters in the synovium. Crystals are present in small clusters in the synovium here. So I think we have exhausted our time. So we can do it next time, right? All right, so we'll stop here. Thank you very much for being with me. Thank you for very much for being a patient listener. And we will continue our topic. Inshallah, we'll finish it in the next lecture. Okay, Allah Hafiz.